All right. Welcome to another great CEO podcast. I have with me today, Cameron Clark from Sunderstorm. Welcome, Cameron. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Jim. I'm happy to be here. That's great. Um, maybe in a few sentences, you could tell us a little bit about yourself and about your company. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've done a lot of different things in my life. I uh, was one of the original importers of the acai berry into, uh, into the United States back in the day. Uh, I also have a tech background, done some software stuff. Um, and uh, about uh, six or seven years ago, I stumbled into the cannabis industry because I was doing some uh, scientific research um, and uh, always been a big advocate of plant medicines. So I decided to, uh, to start Sunderstorm. And um, Sunderstorm is uh, one of the top 10 brands in California. We are the uh, number four edible brand in the country. And um, we're growing leap by, by leaps and bounds. And, um, you know, very, had a very exciting year this year with our launch into uh, three new states. So we're in four states now and Canada. Wow, phenomenal. So, you know, uh, you, a while ago, there was nobody in the space, so you didn't need a competitive advantage. But it's starting to get, you know, a little bit crowded in terms of the number of players in the space. So what? why do people pick you versus any other choice they might have? In terms of in terms of the consumers shopping for our brand or? Yeah. 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 You know, it, 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 it's a crazy competitive industry. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding out there about, you know, you know, green dollar signs in people's eyes about you know, being able to get rich in the cannabis industry. And the truth is, it's a lot like the dot com uh, in that, you know, a ton of people have come in. There is a ton of capital is flooded into the industry and, um, you know, some of it uh, not spent so wisely. And so it's uh, it's hyper competitive. Um, there's a lot of uh, choices for consumers. And you also have an interesting dynamic that, you know, a lot of the industry has grown up out of uh, you know, what was really the, the unregulated market, right? So you could, you know, you could put whatever you wanted on a label uh, and the consumers didn't know necessarily what they're getting. And, you know, in, in California, we still have uh, the regulated industry still battles with the, uh, with the uh, illicit industry. And so, you know, it makes it, makes it quite, uh, quite challenging. But, you know, one of the things that when, when, when I came into this industry, I told everyone from the very beginning, I said, uh, we're going to be the Nordstroms of the industry. Any consumer can return anything, anytime, for any reason, no questions asked. And I told my sales reps, don't, you know, don't ever ask, just take it back. I don't care if it's a year down the road. And, you know, we wanted to be that brand that consumers can trust, right? right? And so there's been a lot of, you know, shady practices in this industry over the years. You know, we tested everything in the beginning. You know, we wanted to make sure what, when, when others put 300 milligrams of THC on their products uh, and they only put 30 milligrams in the bag, we wanted to be that brand that put 300 milligrams in, 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 in the bag. And so that's, you know, we, we wanted to build that trust and, and reputation uh, with the consumers. And so we fought very hard to do that. And I think that's one of the reasons that, uh, that we've been so, so successful. And I think the other thing is we just... We've executed really well. You know, I have a lot of business experience. My my business partner uh, started on Wall Street, and he also started uh, several different companies. And we just wanted to make sure that 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 we we ran our business uh, frugally. We had uh, uh, you know 19% EBITDA last year, wow. and we you know which is which is a rarity in this industry, particularly in California. And I think a lot a lot of it has to do with you know um, understanding that. You know, you can't always uh, have everything you want and you got to be frugal and you got to you got to build uh, build that relationship with the consumers and, and the retailers. And so, you know, it's it's a multi pronged approach. Yep. Awesome. So what percentage of your revenue recurs every year? I think probably none because it's a retail product. They buy it if they come back. Awesome. But there's no guaranteed what's next year going to look like. Right. That's right. That's right. It's, we, we are we are basically a food manufacturing company. Right. Right. We sell we sell food products and the consumers uh, in a lot of consumers eat them every week. So, you know, in California, we're, we're selling, you know, three fifty to four hundred thousand bags of gummies a, a month. So there's, wow. a, there's a lot of consumers enjoying our products. That's great. But it's all brand preference. Right. That's what brings them back. Got it. That's right. Well, there's a, it, it's all, but it's also very competitive, right? So, you know, it, we have, uh, you know, uh, a number of, uh, of, of uh, strong competitors, but two particularly uh, very aggressive and fierce. And uh, we're all, uh, you know, duking it out in the trenches for market share. And it's more than just, 
uh, building that brand awareness and connection to the consumer. It's also, you know, marketing act activations and activities and promotions. You know, we have a whole retail marketing team that that uh, works with the shops uh, every single week to be able to to make sure that the proper promotions are in place. Wow, and uh, that's how you that's how you win the the hearts and minds of the consumer. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a CPG you gotta try your products. It's a CPG product, right? Win the shelf space and keep it turning, right? That's, that's exactly right. So I grew up. One thing that's interesting, I grew up in a family of, of retail, uh, retail, uh, and retail clothing. So my parents had thirty five stores. I learned all about turns, right? Yeah. And we want anything to sit on the shelves. And having that retail experience actually, is, I think, has been very, very helpful uh, um, for us to be successful because we, I walk into the retailers and I tell my reps, you know, nothing sits on the shelf. And by the way, it's one thing to get the product on the shelf. Gotta now you got to get the product off the shelf. And yeah. so we, we focus on both of those, uh, both those act activities uh, uh, aggressively. So, so if you could change one thing in the business, the point of constraint, like if I could open up this one point of constraint, it would change the business to the positive, either revenue growth or profitability or, what would be the one thing you could change around your business? You know what? It's it, it's it's the regulatory environment, right? We're right. we're 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 hampered by the regulatory environment and the fact that it's that it's still federally illegal, yeah. right? So, for example, we have safe banking issues, right? Yeah. You you, uh, you can't get, uh, you know, you it, 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 we we actually do have a bank account, which is nice because we we're, we're with a bank that was willing to take the risk, but because because there's no true federal federally legal safe banking. Uh, you can't trade on the stock market, right? Wow. So you and and you have uh, there, there there is a there are impediments for 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 uh, a number of capital sources to come in and provide capital uh, to be able to help businesses grow. The other thing is that it's been very expensive uh, debt uh, to raise debt. Yeah. So you know it's it's finally coming down. Uh, I think we're we're somewhere around. You know, seeing deals around 15, 16 percent oh. right now. But, <laughs> but if it's like, it's like mes debt, my goodness. Wow. It's it's unbelievable. Right. We had 19 percent EBITDA last year. We were one of the fastest growing companies in the, uh, in the in the country, according to the Inc. 5000. And and yet we can't go to the bank and borrow. So what we what do we have to do? We have to sell little pieces of the company every time we need extra capital to be able to grow. Wow. And, you know, the other complication is that every state is siloed. Right. So we have to set up manufacturing in in every state. So that that has its complexities. We can't transport across the borders. Boy. So if if we could deal with the with the uh, federal legalization issues, there's a there's a uh, an IRS uh, issue called 280E, which which means that uh, we're not allowed to deduct a number of our expenses, including wow. marketing expenses and my salary and other things. Mm -hmm. So we're taxed on we're, we're taxed at a much higher uh, equivalent rate than than normal companies, and so that makes it really hard to make money. So you know the the truth. The answer to your question is if we could if we could release the friction yeah. from the regulatory framework and you know have a proper have a little bit better tax uh, situation, uh, the companies would would thrive and uh, the good the good companies would survive and thrive and survive survive and make a lot of money. Got it. And you get some scale, and you yeah you know it's funny. Yeah. There's this concept of change layers and you know, technology changes at one speed, social acceptance changes at another speed, culture changes at another. And way at the inside, the slowest changing thing there is, maybe outside of religion, is government. <laughs> so yes. um, good, I mean, you're, that's a tough get, it's a tough lift you got there. So, so, how many, sure. so let's go to how many hours a week you work, how many hours a week you working in the business? You know, I think I'm probably doing, you know, 70 to 80 hours a week. I mean, there was, I will tell you that for the first um, three years, three to three to three and a half years, I was I, I did consistent hundred hour weeks every week. Wow. I mean, it was it was brutal. Uh, you had to. It's just so competitive, and we had to get to a certain scale. Yeah. Right. And so now, what you're seeing in the industry, it's interesting. We we saw this just before COVID, where if you didn't, if you weren't of a certain scale, all of a sudden you start to kind of fade out. And this is what happened in the dot com era, right? The companies that were at scale were the ones that got all the capital and could 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 then take that and grow. Yeah. But then COVID hit, and all of a sudden everybody had to have their their uh, their home medication. Yeah. And so all of the, the whole industry had a big lift, and so that propped up a number of the companies in the in, in the industry. 
And now what we're seeing is we're, we're starting to see that reset again yeah. and, and capital is drying up. And so now you're, you're finding that there is an abundance of product in the market. There's an abundance of competitors. There's a, an abundance of, of, of companies that are uh, not well capitalized and not well and, and don't execute well. And so you're seeing, you know, the kind of the separation of what I call the haves and the have nots. And so that is, that is a dynamic which is occurring in the industry, and and it's 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 going to be it's going to be quite rough in uh, through 2022 actually for, for well until the winners are picked business. basically right and then it'll yeah. yeah it's it's happening now I mean that 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 is happening now and uh, you know it's and it doesn't always mean that the most well capitalized are going to win either because right. you've got to win the hearts and minds of the consumers and if you I mean I've seen companies in this industry that. I think we're worth probably $500 million at one point that are today worth zero. Uh, and it's because they, you know, they literally overnight destroyed their, their relationship with the consumers and that trust and they're gone. Wow. So yeah. I mean, you must've done this if you went from a hundred to 70 or so hours a week, but if you can name one major responsibility that you've delegated or gotten rid of in the last six months, what would that be? Uh, you know, while I'm still overseeing marketing, yeah. I'm, I've I finally hired a, a, a true CMO. So, okay. so uh, you know, I'm not really a marketing person, but I've been driving marketing over the years, and so I handed that off, and uh, and now my CMO is uh, is is unloading a lot of that off my plate, which is great because that requires you know marketing requires a lot of finesse and a lot of detail and a lot of you know it's 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 fuzzy, right? And so. You know, we're trying to build, uh, you know, the, the the first true national edibles brand, yeah. And so that requires a heavy investment in marketing. And so, you know, I, you know I, I I I would rather focus my energy on business development. That's where Got I think it. that I'm, I'm best suited. Nice. And technology, to be honest, because I have a technology background. Right. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of these firms are not particularly tech enabled, so there's a potential leverage point there that you might have that others don't. But I'll also tell you, like, uh, you know, one of the more exciting things for me is I just recently hired, he, he started uh, two weeks ago, my director of systems and IT. And, you know, originally, originally we were looking for an IT person. I have a, I have a software development background. So I've tried to use as much technology in our industry as possible to be able to gather the data so that we can, we can pivot and, and really navigate the, the, the treacherous waters, uh, you know, as efficiently as we can. I call it tacking. Yeah. Um, and I'm very excited to have him on board because, you know, his whole role is to make sure that all of our systems and processes in the company are efficient. And I, I, my new mantra is eliminate friction. Yeah. So I am, I, you know, that's his job is to eliminate friction in all aspects of the company and enhance uh, communication between different different uh, uh, departments. And that is going to be a huge help for me. Nice. Uh, very off cool. my shoulder. So, um. Give me one or two things that characterize your CEO style. I mean, you've learned how to be a CEO here. How would you characterize if I had to pick a couple of words to describe you as a CEO? What would those be? Yeah, you know, I I think it's I think it's really focused on 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 execution, mm -hmm. and you know, one of the things is that uh, that I'm not afraid to admit in my life, and I think a lot of CEOs you know might be is I've had a lot of failures in my life, mm. right? I've, I've started a lot of companies, I've tried a lot of different things, I've beat my head against the wall a number of times, and I've failed. Mm. And to be honest, I'm telling you, I would not be successful in this industry today if not for all those failures. Mm. Because uh, it's the, the, the complexity that exists in this industry between the regulatory framework, bec between competing with the, with the illicit market, uh, you know, trying to operate in silos in different states, all, all you know, it's, 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 you know, trying to deal with a product that's, that, that's a medical product as well as a recreational product, you know, it's, it's, it's immensely complicated and, mm -hmm. you know, raising capital and all of that. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, where I feel like I, I've really been successful is we built this whole, we built our entire business on, on about $10 million uh, of fundraising so far. And we have wow. competitors that have raised a lot more than that uh, many, many times over. And, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with, we, with the fact that we were very, very frugal in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, buy, we didn't buy new stuff. We bought used stuff, right? And we made, and we fixed things when they were broken. And we still have that mentality today. And so, um, 
I think that's that that's an important part of of, of how I uh, uh, drive the drive the the company. But I think something else is really important, and that is uh, we have a culture here of listening to everybody mm-hmm. and making sure that 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 uh, that you know anybody who has an idea, that idea is is available to be discussed. And I think you know that's something that a lot of CEOs don't necessarily do. Um, and I don't look at this as you know a, you know necessarily me driving the entire organization. You know I don't care if you know someone you know is sweeping the floors. They may have a great idea on where we should put our where we should put our equipment in our in our in our the layout of our facility, right? And we should listen to everybody. And in, especially when it's a complex uh, industry and a complex business, we need as much brain power as we possibly can get. And you know, people from and, and all aspects of our company, we have uh, about 260 employees. They all have great ideas, and I'm happy to listen to all of them. We may nice. not implement everybody's, wow. but I love, uh, you know, I want to hear what people what, what people have to uh, say, what they think, and we have a very open culture that way. Nice. That's great. Um, last question, easy one. What do you do for fun? <laughs> I love to sail. So, yeah. so yeah, so... Uh, one of the things that was great during, uh, during COVID was, you know, hard to go out and do, do anything fun. So, uh, I, I, uh, figured out how to get a sailboat and I've uh, been spending a ton of time out in, uh, out in the Marina and over, over on the West coast here, we have Catalina Island, which is yeah. beautiful. And it's like, you know, taking a vacation, you know, go over for the weekend, take a vacation to, it feels like taking a vacation to Europe. So wonderful. Uh, yeah. That's been, that's been a, my saving grace. <laughs> that's great. Well, Cameron, hey, thanks for this interview. Really awesome. And I wish you very good luck uh, in the future. So thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed it. Absolutely.